good evening uh, chairperson dear delegates i bring you greetings from pgi chandigarh and this is uh, the aerial view of my hospital i work here as a trauma intensivist and i also start i am also the course coordinator of dm trauma anesthesia and acute care so today we are going to talk about a very important topic and uh, this is damage control resuscitation and in the next 15 minutes i will tell you what advances we have achieved over this important topic so will we all know that trauma is a leading cause of death in india and road fatalities have shown an escalation from 2007 to 17 however the same goes over all all over in the globe also there are so many deaths happening all over the globe due to trauma and more importantly these deaths are associated with a younger age group uh, between 40 to 60 it becomes very important for us to understand what is the major cause of mortality in trauma patients so without any doubt we all know that hemorrhage is the leading cause of mortality in trauma patients if you talk about the timing and mechanisms we have seen that even in the pre hospital or the first 24 hours as compared to other injuries hemorrhage takes the lead in mortality so it's very important to understand how to manage an acutely hemorrhaging patient exsanguinating and then in extremis so the topic which i'm going to discuss is all about those first 30 to 60 minutes when the patient is acutely bleeding and we as you all know that when the patient is acutely bleeding there's a bloody vicious cycle which starts which is which encompasses acidosis hypothermia and coagulopathy now this chart is not new to any one of us but i would like to go more into details of why this acidosis occurs and why hypothermia and why coagulopathy so i put this slide forward so when when the patient is acutely bleeding so we all know there is a reduction in circulating volume and therefore also Con, the, this consumes the clotting factors and therefore decreases the clot production so as the clot production decreases this worsens bleeding further reducing the volume and inhibiting the cellular perfusion and causing acidosis and hypothermia further when we try to resuscitate these patients then the coagulopathy is worsened due to the dilutional effects of crystalloid restoration so metabolic acidosis happens because of poor perfusion and hypoxemia which results from reduced circulating volume and oxygen carrying capacity also decreases so acidosis is further uh, you know directly impairs the clotting factors and worsens coagulopathy so acidosis and say ph is 7.1 is very detrimental and it reduces the clotting factors like 5 10 10a and 7a so further acidosis also uh, also it holds back endogenous heat production and worsens hypothermia now hypothermia again it worsens uh, perfusion and thus it also promotes anaerobic metabolism we must understand that for each degree uh, decrease in temperature there is a 10% decrease in the coagulation factors so that is why this whole contributes to a lethal triad also known as the bloody vicious cycle which i just described so all important to know is that the coagulopathy starts setting as soon as trauma happens in certain cases if the horizontal line is taken as the x axis and this is the time zone which is being shown you see that acute traumatic coagulopathy sets within the first 30 minutes and then as we resuscitate the patients this combines with the acute traumatic coagulopathy and then further on when the patient you know goes into a later uh, stage it also uh, goes into the prothrombotic stage so the trauma induced coagulopathy becomes a big issue because uh, as as we have already seen that trauma induced factors and then certain endogenous responses they promote a acute, acute traumatic coagulopathy which is due to the release of activated protein c so this again leads to some auto heparinization some release of factors which is like heparin types and that promotes further bleeding in these patients so traumatic coagulopathy happens due to many factors to sum it up all due to dilutional then the sinister triad of coagulopathy also due to consumption coagulopathy and then due to trauma itself and release of some endogenous coagulation factors so 
we have to understand then what is this damage control where, where this word originally coined by us navy in reference to techniques for salvaging a ship came to our rescue and navy defined it as the capacity of ship to you know absorb the damage and maintain mission integrity like if just maintain seaworthiness and uh, operational management till you uh, and do not go for the complete repair of the damage taking a cue from this in trauma settings we defined an uh, this strategy which was also aimed at a you know time uh, time limit as i already said within the first uh, one hour and it targets the condition that exacerbates hemorrhage in trauma patients and we termed it as damage control resuscitation so it's a bundled approach it doesn't happen by only one factor you have to do so many things simultaneously for example like you have to start with like uh, permissive hypotension rapid rewarming limiting your crystalloid and colloid infusion and then uh, initiating early blood based component therapy and then correction of hyperfibrinolysis hypofibrinolemia and other coagulopathies and then last and not the least damage control surgery this all goes hand in hand together within the time gap for a patient who is extremely damaged so talking about hypotensive resuscitation you can see here are two uh, you know vessels which are being seen most of us would like the one which is vaso constricted and we would like to push blood towards the patient however the principles of damage control resuscitation dictate a sort of a vaso dilated state so it's just like an oxymoron on one side we say resuscitation on another side we said keep the patient vaso dilated and i'll tell you in the coming slides why so defining permissive hypotension it's a strategy of deferring or restricting fluid administration until hemorrhage is controlled while accepting a limited period of suboptimal organ per perfusion so what this was this came from a historical background by walter kennan he proposed this that he says that if you inject fluids before the surgeon is able to see from where the bleeding comes you may lose blood that is sorely needed this was further you know studied by henry beecher who was an anesthesiologist during world war 2 and he told us that keep the goals of systolic blood pressure from 80 to 90 that as this was beneficial before surgery so then beckel and his colleagues they studied in this uh, immediate versus delayed fluid resuscitation for hypotension in patients who had penetrating torso injuries this was a large uh, cohort like 598 acute uh, adults with penetrating torso injury who had uh, pre hospital blood pressure less than or equal to 90 the authors they found that if you delay resuscitation in these patients they were they were benefited in terms of survival rather than those who had an early on resuscitation so this was one landmark paper which came in new england journal of medicine which told us that please delay resuscitation first try to correct the other factors so this was further on studied in animals and also in human studies in animals it was studied in swine rats sheep and um, uh, it was seen that if you keep pressures more than 80 there are more animals who died than those in than those group in which the pressures were kept less than 80 here the number of deaths were much less further on the same studies were also conducted in humans as prospective and randomized trials although there was no mortality benefit uh, in um, uh, two studies one study particularly showed a significant difference in mortality uh, when they followed this protocol of keeping pressures less than 80 so why not why not uh, we, we should go ahead with early resuscitation so basically if you resuscitate early it increases the ventricular preload causes an immediate increase in blood pressure and may even reverse uh, vasoconstriction and directly displace early fibrin clots so once the hemorrhage is con controlled and uh, normovolemia is uh, uh, is you know you have achieved then you can go ahead with it so basically if you delay your uh, resuscitation you don't pop the clot which is which is earlier on uh, blocking the bleeding so when we talk about fluid uh, therapy in uh, trauma resuscitation it comes to our mind should i give fluids and if i if i give fluids should they be liberal or they should be restrictive so well ats dilles guidelines tells us that do not give too much of fluids 1 liter of crystalloid is enough say 20 cc per kg if the patient is less than 40 kg during your initial assessment and we will see why this has been recommended colloids are a big no because colloids they cause uh, increased kidney injury and are as our patients are acutely bleeding they already run the risk of pre renal 
kidney kidney disorder and uh, we should avoid any drug or uh, or treatment which can further enhance any kidney injury so expense and lack of survival benefit uh, has been seen over crystal oils so some of you must be wondering can i use the newer gelatin uh, newer uh, generation gelatins like maxil yes there are some advantages like it's a low molecular weight cheaper and it is rapidly excreted by kidney so less renal impairment than hes there is no upper limit of volume that can be infused like starches and dextran and then in remote settings like in our indian scenario if you are really sitting far off it may help you to overuse crystal oil but please remember that gelatins are associated with nf electrode reactions so basically you must remember this um, good quote from dr philip he says blood is for bleeding salt water is for cooking pasta so if your patient is bleeding actively please go ahead with blood so here i'm going to talk about active bleeding go ahead with hemostatic recess and when we say hemostatic hemostatic recess it means give a balanced transfusion go ahead with red blood cells fresh frozen plasma and platelets in one go it is not that you start keep on giving blood uh, red blood cells or you keep on giving fresh frozen plasma you have to do it hand in hand and why i say this it is most evidence based and the first first one came from this um, uh, editorial by uh, holcom et al who said that please start massive transfusion protocols because we have paid considerable attention to uh, damage control surgery and reversing acidosis and hypothermia but we haven't directed our attention towards coagulopathy so this this was further highlighted that uh, by them by they, they said that please do active massive transfusion and you should go ahead with 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 2 ratio of fresh frozen plasma with prbcs following this there were many trials like the promet trial but i will focus on proper trial which is a pragmatic trial and uh, uh, with, uh, considering the plasma is to platelet ratio here the authors tried to see whether 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 2 is beneficial and authors found in a, you know when they randomized the patients uh, a large number of patients that is 680 patients they found that in terms of hemostasis 1 is to 1 is to 1 group fares better than 1 is to 1 is to 2 group whereas the mortality benefits are not so huge having said that hemostasis is better achieved with 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio so therefore till we all follow 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio so the recommendation from eastern guidelines also uh, suggest the same that follow massive transfusion program and try to do 1 is to 1 is to 1 about Uh, tranexamic acid we all know that it should be considered in bleeding patient there is enough evidence to suggest that and for factor 7 factor 7 is very interesting to use it looks very impressive but factor 7 is uh, you know very expensive and it has a prerequisite to it like you have to have the patient who is not acidotic with a certain amount of platelets not hypothermic so factor 7 is recommended but not as uh, the first line it is not to be uh, you know really thought of as the first agent to be used what about the whole blood programs they are coming back to us because it has been seen that whole blood has a lesser volume than the component therapy itself like whole blood has a volume of 570 as opposed to 690 with a combination also factors are more in whole blood but whole blood is not available to us in all places and we are waiting for more data to come in trauma settings having said that we should think about whole blood if it is available to us surgical strategy is integrated into the damage control resuscitation and once your patient is resuscitated should be sent for damage control resurgery and a patient comes back to icu for further management and, and uh, definitive management rewarming should always be considered by using insulating foils blankets and removal of wet clothes and you should be warmed with infusions of 40 to 42 degrees or heated air inhalations or uh, you can do uh, invasive uh, warming like gastric and body cavity lavage and keeping the or or er temperature at neutral range a word about calcium calcium is a very very important cation because it it is a central uh, to coagulation uh, factors if you do not have uh, calcium in surplus then clotting doesn't happen also with acidosis we tend to lose too much of calcium and uh, hypothermia again it causes calcium uh, deficiency so we must improve upon the calcium management also as lethal triad is slowly paving its way into lethal diamond so to sum it all i would say that trauma 
trauma guidelines dictate circulation management earlier than ABC, early tunique, specialist retrieval, early massive transfusion, active warming, aggressive treatment of coagulopathy and then damage control resuscitation. For this, we must reduce crystalloid and reduce acidosis, manage the biochemistry, prevent hypothermia and avoid vasopressors to let not the clot, uh, clot pop and then improve tissue perfusion by giving blood transfusion, effective coagulation, normal electrolytes and preservation of tissue and this whole will in reduce the mortality. So I end uh, with this slide. Thank you very much for your kind attention.